Well, good morning, everybody. We're back doing another live stream. It feels like it's been forever. Am I there? Oh, I'm there. <laughs> Yay. I know it's been a few weeks on the road in Europe. Uh, I did several zoo consultations. And of course, there were two conferences I attended, the European Association of Zoos and Aquariums annual conference. And there was the largest uh, Congress for Zoos and Aquarius, Aquariums in Poland. So that was their largest event they've had um, on record. And Annette is here. Yay, who I just saw in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> and Al's here. Yay. So I'm um, very happy to be back with you for another You Be the Behavior Consultant. I know it's been a few weeks and the summer was crazy this year. So we haven't had as many of these as we usually do, but we're back. So let's go ahead and get started. And um, if you're a member of Animal Training, Fundamentals.com, we have a tower talk tomorrow. So we can talk more about what happened at these events and all the cool things that um, are going on in um, Europe. Europe right now so lots of great stuff all right but let's go ahead and get started with our live stream this is you be the behavior consultant a uh, live stream I try to do most Mondays we've had a little bit of a break uh, recently but we are back and this is how it works I present a topic for discussion and I've got some questions to prompt your participation we love it when you guys share your experiences here we like to be interactive and then of course um, I got lots of videos because this is one of those topics that I think uh, is pretty easy to get videos of because we we um, all like to train this behavior it has lots of purposes and then of course I'm going to recap everything at the end so what are we talking about this week we're talking about station training woohoo oh and Hel uh, uh, Helene's here from Dubai yay we are super international today. So we're going to talk about station training and, of course, some questions to get you participating here. Uh, I'd love to hear about how straight station training has been important to your training. How have you used station training? Um, I do have a slide with some examples of how I've used station training. And we've got um, Sue Ann here from Florida as well. And maybe some of the things you've used as stations. When I was looking through my videos, I found that um, it, I tended, there tended to be the same things being used for stations over and over again. So it'd be interesting to hear if some of you came up with, uh, or some of you have used some unusual things for stationing um, animals. So I'd love to hear some of your examples. And if stationing was ever challenging for you, Oh, and we've got some uh, Arkansas here. We've got we've got everybody joining us today. I guess uh, taking a break <laughs> gets gets everybody missing us a little bit. So it's nice to have you all here. Um, yeah, and so if stationing was ever challenging for you, maybe you could share how how it was challenging and maybe what you did to overcome the challenge. Oh, and we've got Ari from New Jersey. Thank you everybody for joining. This is great. We we missed you all. It's so nice to have everyone here. Um, yeah, it's it was a uh, it was a long trip uh, in. Uh, in Europe but it's good to be back home that's for sure and Europe was great too we we definitely got um, a lot of a lot of good times in uh, especially at the IASA conference where people are really excited about the information but we'll talk all about that tomorrow so let's talk about station training a little bit anybody um, have some uh, examples of station training that was really important to you or helpful to you I can certainly uh, um, share some examples as we get going along here and maybe, um, maybe while you are thinking of examples, I can certainly provide a definition that I came up with. I, I think because we all just sort of, you know, assume we all know what stationing or station training looks like. But um, while you're thinking of examples, I'll, I'll provide a definition that I've, I've put together. And again, there's, you know, there's no official right or wrong here. This is just my own words. Oh, Annetta has one, uh, or how she's used it. She organizes uh, group training to avoid getting bitten <laughs> or um, a freeze behavior with a pig. Um, and she's used it for um, checking sex in a mouse deer. Oh, yeah, and that's a great video, which is available on YouTube, if I am correct, under the Copenhagen Zoo's account. So you can check that one. Um, they put a little GoPro um, camera underneath the station. And um, and so the little mouse deer crawls on top of the, well, not crawls, walks on top of the station. And, and you can, and uh, gets a video of the underside so they can check the sex of the mouse deer without being invasive on the animal there. 
um, eel station and tubes. Yes, I've seen that one too. I, um, that's a really good one. So that, so I think that's really cool with aquatics so that they're, you know, so that the animals, again, you can manage the groups. And so each station, each eel goes into their own tube as their own station and they can feed each animal individually. So they don't have competition between the animals. I love that one. Uh, Helene says, we use stationing for photos during guest encounters with the penguins, right? The penguins stand up on their station and we can position the guests behind them. Oh yeah, that's a really good one. Uh, and Smart Dog says, I share life with six animals and often train several dogs in one session. So I use the session a lot for wait your turn. These are really great examples. I love these. Oh, in the mirror box with the birds. Oh yeah, that's a good one. I, I think I have a video. Um, actually, I know where that video clip is. Um, for those of you that have not yet seen our IAZA animal training guidelines, there is a link to that video in the guidelines. So you can go check out um, the example. So it's a um, it's a flat top, but the puffins, this is at Copenhagen Zoo, they shared this video, get on top of a, a clear plexiglass top and there is a mirror that's on a slant underneath that. And so the puffins stand on that so that the um, keepers can check the condition of their feet, make sure their feet are looking nice and healthy. And Chris says she stations her horse while she puts hay in her feeder. Oh, I love that. Not fun having a thousand pounds horse, a uh, thousand pound horse muscle in while she feeds. And Al says stationing for separations so that you again, managing these groups of animals. Oh, you guys have such great examples here. I love this. Uh, I think these are even better than the examples I have to share. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish I had video of all of these to share. These are awesome. Thank you guys. Um, and, uh, and Annetta says on mats, we can put on scales and crates and put them in, um, in crates as well. Yeah. Oh, perfect. These are all excellent and they are um, going to be very supportive of some of the videos that I um, tried to select for this particular one. I tried to pick videos that hopefully I haven't shared with you before because um, it's easy to just go to my old standbys and then we're sort of watching the same videos over and over. So I wanted to pull in some new ones that, that you haven't seen. Uh, and Carrie says, we teach a station to our small tortoise. It's a shelf like a magic like a magic carpet. When he comes to station, we can lift the shelf out of habitat and, um, and work with him in a presentation. Oh, I like that. So you're not just picking him up and carrying him um, with his little legs dangling, I'm assuming. Yeah, I like that. So it's more more like a comfortable ride for him. I like that so much. It's great. You guys have come up with such excellent examples here. And I think these are all going to be very inspiring for people that um, are watching this. And uh, Cynthia's here better late than never. Oh, I can't wait to talk to you. I hope you're joining us tomorrow for the Tower Talk because I want to hear about your, your new... Uh, your new training subject. Um, and Al says, a station location for a dog when guests arrive in your home. Yeah, so your animal knows what to do to uh, perhaps get attention from guests. Oh, I like it. Awesome. Oh, you guys are coming up with so many examples. This is so nice. All right, you can keep writing those examples in there. I'm going to go for my, my definition here. So um, it's kind of similar. I, I realize it's kind of similar to the target training one, but maybe with a few little tweaks. So I have orienting a body part towards something and holding position or location for duration. Often animals are trained to sit, stand, or lay down on stations. And I think maybe that's a little bit of our, our modification compared to um, just targeting in general. Stationing, we do consider a foundation behavior, I think, and it's frequently used to facilitate training other behaviors, um, such as cooperation and medical care. And the station, the noun, can be a, um, any identified stimulus, right? So lots of different things can be stations. But usually we use things like a mat, a stump, a perch, a rock, a location in the environment. Um, and again, just like with targeting, sort of that's all limited by our creativity and our needs and our imagination. So so that's kind of what I came up with, um, kind of similar to targeting, but with a few slight little, little uh, twists on it there. And since you guys mentioned so many wonderful examples there, Oh, station on x-ray plates. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. I like that. Why don't I show a few videos um, 
And I don't think this one has sound, and even if it does, I could turn it down. It's not so important. This one is an old one from uh, when I did some consulting at Dallas Zoo many, many years ago. We trained some marabou storks to just station on overturned grain tubs, and um, and there was several in the enclosure, and they would, um, I'm going to maybe play, oh, I'm going to go back here. Sorry. I'm going to go back to our definition. They um, they would just come. They, it was a mixed species exhibit, and so the marabous would come up and stand on the on the stations there. And I think what was kind of cool is we didn't really have criteria that they had to be on specific overturned tubs. Tubs. It was just sort of if you see an overturned tub, just stand on it. <laughs> um, so we had um, that example, and then this one I think does have a little audio. I don't know if it's so important. Um, is, uh, yeah, maybe I can turn down the audio a little bit. Uh, I think somebody mentioned something along this line, maybe, uh, stationing for when you're entering an enclosure. Maybe, I'm not sure if somebody mentioned this one or not, but, um, so this is Russell Crowe, who I think I'll get to see in a week or so when I go to the conference, the ZAA conference in Providence. Um, and what I like about this particular example is that you're going to see that um, Russell works for a lot of different types of reinforcers. And yes, there was food used initially, but he also responds to touch as a reinforcer. And you're also going to see um, Jess use some... Uh, enrichment items as a reinforcer. And and this is quite an old video too, but I think what was really cool is way back then we were we were recognizing that there were several different things that were important to him. And so we were we were trying to do a good job using quote the functional reinforcer. <laughs> and so you'll see her give him some uh, sticks and things to put in the bowl. But but lots of different things were were helpful to him as reinforcers for stationing. It's all that about looking at your animal, right? What do they like? And then just another example. This is a, a, a pheasant. Good. Oh, and Anetta likes the video of the of the crow. <laughs> There's a different person. Yeah, who is that? Oh my goodness. What? And Go again, boy. just sharing some examples here. Good boy. Good boy. And another example. And so this, um, speaking of uh, education animals, so this animal is part of uh, education programs and they use a station um, to get started with him. He also responds to touch as a reinforcer. And so when they want to take him out on programs, they also use the station to, to uh, kind of indicate, okay, we're, you know, are you interested in going out on a program? And um, they use that touch as a reinforcer for him. All right. So let me go back to, um, some of the comments here. So uh, Cynthia says the first thing she taught her energy buddy, wild child mini mule Billy Bob was to station. <laughs> and Al says a pool edge chin rest for sea lion and walrus is stationing. Oh, I, I like that. Yeah, and I think that's kind of cool because that actually is like the, the first thing I have here is for a type of stations is like a specific location can be a, a station. It doesn't have to be an object um, necessarily. So like, you know, like I was saying, like some people use a rock in the enclosure or a stump or even a stump that they can move around. Or it might be like a wooden board or a mat, or it could be a hanging target and sort of orient towards where that hanging target is. Um, with like some of the smaller animals, I've seen people use a clip that they hang on something. When I was just in... Um, where was it? At Helsinki Zoo, uh, Kolkosari, they had these um, cloth um, 
like a piece of cloth that had Velcro on it that they could wrap around a perch and two different colored ones that they used for some macaws that became that so they could wrap it around a branch. So that was kind of kind of cool. Um, you may have a platform that becomes a station. You saw the overturned tub with the the stork um, again, safety cones, you know, orient towards the safety cone. Um, Al says opposing substrate. So tile versus carpet. So, um, you know, which which is the appropriate one for that individual? Yeah, yeah, that's a That's a great idea. Um, and I think you guys really touched on this a lot. So what are the uses of stationing? Oh, and what's what's uh, this one? Like a name perch. Yeah, so so like name tag targets, right? And um, oh, and Annetta likes the idea with the wraparound stations for macaws. And I'm sure you could use that with lots of different um, types of perching animals you know so if they had the the colored cloth that has velcro on it these were pretty thick they they looked like they were almost made out of like canvas or something so they're not so destructible i wish i had taken a picture of them they were pretty cool <laughs> um because at first i thought they were something to wrap around your arm but they were actually for the perch uh helene says we have made fake rock stations they are normally on top of the ice on the podium however we can move them around when we have guests who are unable or don't want to approach the podium yeah so for small and also for small primates yeah i think they would these wrap around things could be good for small primates and again it gives them sort of a really big a big target, so to speak, a big station, um, whereas sometimes the clips and things are uh, are a little small. But again, you know, same same idea as the name tag targets. So, um, so on these uses of station training, you guys really had uh, uh, so many of these examples. I thought um, identified. So I think I think a great thing for stationing is it 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 gives us sort of. Um, a waiting behavior, so to speak, something to do in between other behaviors. And I know Annetta talks about this a lot, which I think is so, so important, is that it's important to teach animals to wait as a behavior, something that we actually reinforce. And when we have that beha that behavior of station, when we think of it as stationing and we actually train it and we train it with duration, then we tend to focus on that idea of, ah, this is a reinforceable behavior that I'm actually going to focus on training and breaking it down into those steps and what is it going to look like. Uh, we can also use it to, to manage our day-to-day -day care of the animal, and I think someone did mention that already. Uh, and, and this was a great one that Carrie mentioned about, about moving animals without coercion, so without having to pick them up or manipulate the animal. So, um, so I think that's a really great example. A lot of you have mentioned this is a great way for us to manage groups of animals. And of course, we can use it to get other behaviors. So if you're trying to train a behavior, like getting an animal onto a scale, or maybe training a medical behavior where you need the animal to hold some sort of position. And we can even use it to train things like recall. So if the animal knows to station and you're trying to get it to move from one location to another, if they see that station as kind of like a target, they can move towards that. And Al mentioned already about separating animals. Um, it can also be sort of a default behavior. So maybe you're working on a bunch of things, but they can always default to that station behavior. Um, and Andrew says, or with human animals as well. Yeah, you bet. <laughs> Go back to your station. <laughs> I like it. Sit. We all know sit, right? Um, and managing problem behavior. So I think this is um, um, one that we do use a lot. Um, and I'll show you some video examples. And it can be a great introductory behavior um, to training for us as animal trainers and also um, as a behavior for the animal. And again, we can also use it as one of those behaviors where we test how interested is the animal in participating in a training session, especially if it's one of those behaviors that we tend to see as the animal maybe has good reinforcement history with it. They, we might think of it if, if the animal is trained to fluency with it and we ask the animal to to station and they don't seem to be quite interested in doing the behavior, then maybe we say, ah, you know, now's not a good time to have a training session. So I thought we might look at some video examples of some of these things here and um, see how we might apply that. So let's see. So this one is kind of a fun one. Um, this was from one of my recent consultations in Europe. And 
uh, you all, uh, I think pretty much everyone here knows, knows uh, that we've been talking a lot about um, using negative reinforcement to address fear responses. And this particular animal, um, it's a margay, it's a kind of small cat. And what, what the staff had observed is that, um, oh, and Annetta adds also for body examination, yeah, for some of those medical behaviors. So with this margay, what the um, keepers had noticed is when they were in the same space as the, the cat, she tended to move away from people. So a distancing behavior, and we might call that a fear response. So what we wanted to work on is could we work on uh, basically moving a little bit closer towards the animal and, and then moving away when we saw desired responses. And in order to create that kind of a setup, we basically needed the cat to sort of kind of hang out in a certain space. And so we needed a stationing behavior of some sort. But imagine how do you, how do you train that when the cat doesn't really want you around? So what we did is we picked a location where in the past she had been fed but we also wanted it to be kind of in a spot where the cat could move away from us if we basically asked for too much behavior, but we also needed to be far enough away that we could move away from her. Um, so this is kind of a before and after, so you're not gonna see a lot of the steps because I know a lot of you here have watched the courses on negative reinforcement, and if you haven't, you can go to animaltrainingfundamentals.com and get all that information. But you're gonna see that basically what we have is essentially a stationing behavior. We are feeding her on a platform where we want her to spend time so that we can implement our negative reinforcement procedure. So I hope that makes some sense and I'll let you watch the video and um, get an idea of how we're applying this. You need to knock because she'll, she'll, she'll see you and she'll hear the sounds it makes. Do you have to turn the key? Is that what happens? Yeah, just turn it and then, okay. And then, oh, so she moved away. So just cut, step back. Yeah. So she responded to that, right? But yeah. you moved away. But she's still sitting on a perch higher, but she's being vigilant. Mm -hmm. So that let us know that the sound of the door, she was like, oh, I need to go hide. Mm -hmm. so Need to knock. So a lot of what we did was um, in our reps was she would have food there. If she was eating, we would start to approach and then she would look up. <laughs> and um, most of the times, uh, if she would look up and just pay attention, we would kind of freeze and then she would go back to eating and we would remove ourselves. So that that was kind of what we did there. And, um, and we had to start really far away. And what you saw there was how close she was able to get by the second session. All right, so let's look at um, another example. Uh, this one's longer. I'm, I can't remember if I showed you this one before or not, but what the heck, I will show it to you again. <laughs> um, but this is the one with um, our donkeys and our cows, and I'm gonna turn down the audio so I can talk over it. Um, because I'll explain what was going on prior to the past, um, or prior to what's, what you see here. So these, these donkeys and this or mini donkeys and this cow um they um they used to 
they used to basically run over the keeper when he would walk in with food and the donkeys used to bite each other and they used to vocalize loudly. It was not very pretty. And so they created feeding stations for each animal and you'll see each animal has their own little hanging target next to them to sort of help identify this is your own spot. And also um, in the beginning um, they would give them just these pellets in their food bowls there but you'll notice he's adding hay and that's because he discovered that what they when he would go to put hay in their um, feeders in the yard that you'll see that they were really more interested in that and for those of you that are familiar with the degrees of freedom information that um, we've learned from Israel Gold Diamond uh, it, it, to me, this is really cool because you'll see that they can get hay from three different locations right now. And then after the keeper goes in there, they can actually get hay from, I think, like six different locations. But they actually stay at their stations. Um, and um, and I think it's it says a lot about what they have learned by training the station behavior is is that it's not just about getting the hay i think it's also about that they're not having to fight with each other they're not having to compete um so they they also are eliminating some some aversive things some negative reinforcement contingencies and um yeah so it's pretty cool um yeah, lowest cost to stay at your station. I like that. Yeah, so there's more contingencies going on there than just about getting food. It's not just about the 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 food there. And so, um, so yeah, it was pretty cool. And so now, you know, he's putting the hay out at the other places. So they can get the same reinforcers at, at the, the different stations there, which is kind of cool. But yeah, I, I, I've been searching and searching for the, vi the before videos so, uh, to show what this used to look like. But uh, I don't know if I have it. I wish I could, I could find it because it wasn't very pretty. <laughs> so to see where they're at now is, is really nice. A lot more relaxed about things. And yeah, now you can see there's, I think one, there's at least three other locations where they can get the same, same uh, consequences. Pretty cool. So it makes me happy. So definitely a nice, nice thing there. <laughs> it, it's beautiful now. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> nice and calm. I can relate to the before situation. We once had 25 horses. Oh my goodness. Yeah. So very nice. All right. So um, so again, we'll uh, we'll look at the um, the group thing. Okay. Are we doing it? Yes. Good. Yes. You get yours. God, he's staying a long time now. Yes, he is. Nice. Okay. Are we doing so it? So I'll I'll just let this play a little bit. So so this person um she has more conyers than this now and she wanted them to be a little basketball team and um I'll sh you'll see an image later with more of them and before she puts down a ball that they have all learned to put you'll you can see there's a white um square and a blue square those are those are containers where they can put a ball and so some of the birds know to put the ball in the white container and some know to put the ball in the blue container. And so when she puts the ball in, they literally play basketball against each other. But she wants them to start on the stations. And so this is how she manages her, her little group there. Um, okay. And let's see. Um, so here's another example with a gibbon that is learned to hold position for some injection training. And then this one, a little longer video, but this is a, um, 
this this hornbill was um, uh, is a human imprint, so it has a tendency to sort of get in the way when keepers are trying to take care of the habitat and loves attention from people. And I don't believe shifting into another space was something they wanted to do, nor was it much fun for the animal. So instead, what they're doing is reinforcing for stationing for duration. And as you'll see, the food is not really that important to the animal. So she'll offer him food, but she goes back every once in a while and gives him a little attention and things to do. By doing that, he learns to hold on that rock for a little bit longer duration so she can take care of the habitat. And that's a big temptation to him. Whenever she would move like big things or things that were like more enrichment oriented, he was like, oh, I really want to go over there. You can st see he's still holding the food item she gave him in his mouth. So the food isn't really <laughs> all that important. All right, so let's look at another one. Okay, so um, another one I want to share with you is um, some lemurs that um, they're free ranging on this uh, at, at this particular facility, and they wanted to work on some recall training. There's lots of ways that you can do le recall training. This is just one strategy and so they wanted to build reinforcement history for some really obvious stations and so all we're doing is putting some mats down luring them to the mats and then also working on reinforcing after they've been on the mats and the idea was that you know one way that we could recall them is just throw those mats down and they'd be like whoa I know what those are about and then eventually they would come down to those mats so this is just getting that started Oh, I guess it, I guess it doesn't have audio. I could have talked over it. Oh well, sorry about that. So as you can see, we just we just have some food on there, and so sometimes with things like that, it um, it's it's helpful to have the small pieces of food on there, so they're likely to stay on the station and eat the food as opposed to taking the food, you know, picking it up or gathering it all up and going someplace else. And that way they're likely to stay on the station. And then we can, um, after they're hanging out there for a while, then we start delivering the food afterwards. Um, that way, 
down the road, the idea is that you put the mat down and they come to the station first and then you deliver the reinforcers afterwards. But this is just getting it started. So, so we're definitely luring them at first, but that's all right. We just got to get action started so we can reinforce it in the beginning. So with this one, similar idea, and I may turn the sound down on this one. So what they wanted with this little meerkat is they wanted to be able to get a weight on the baby. And so initially, just like you saw with the meerkats, I mean with the lemurs, it was luring um, the baby over to the station. But then we transitioned to reinforcing after the little little one goes to the station after it gets after it's had enough reinforcement history that it's learned oh I should go to that that yellow spot because that's where good things happen and once that started to happen we started using the station to get the animal on the scale because that was really what this team wanted is they wanted to get a weight on just just the baby, but we didn't want all the adults coming over. And so that's why we used the station. And, um, and so, um, cause we could have, you know, tried luring animals over to, over to the scale, but we would have gotten everybody. And we really just wanted the baby. And then eventually it was just reinforcing the baby. So we're trying not to give anything to the big guys and just the little one there. So they got their weight on their baby, so they were happy. <laughs> but we got it started by using the, the station as a way to teach the baby to get on the scale and not necessarily get everybody else. All right, and so it, um, to set up our next video, we're going to look at a problem behavior. All uh, right, and in our problem behavior, you're going, it's probably gonna, for those who work with dogs, you're probably gonna go, this, hey, this looks like a dog problem. Show the bad so um, this porcupine, whenever yeah. people That's would enter, the um, keepers would enter, was always kind of looking to them to see if she could get some of her favorite goodies. And so they basically just trained her to station to get her favorite goodies instead. But you may notice that um, initially food needed to come pretty fast. Or she, or she was inclined to leave the station. So, um, so they had to work up to teaching her to uh, wait <laughs> in order to, to get her food. But we'll talk about how you build duration in just a bit here. Because ideally they wanted to be able to service the habitat. So instead of having a porcupine that was hanging onto their legs while they service the habitat. All right, so a uh, comment. Uh, I use this very technique um, technique to kill flies yesterday, feeding for position. 
<laughs> okay. Um, what were the goodies used for the porcupine and also the meerkats? Okay, so the porcupines really like nuts. So we were using nuts for the porcupine and the meerkats liked mealworms. So we used mealworms for the meerkats. Great questions. All right. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, so, so moving on here. So we, we looked at a bunch of examples. So I thought we'd talk, um, a little bit more about some details about stationing. So what does stationing look like? So, and to me, these are just like sort of questions you may ask yourself about, um, about the stationing behavior that you're going to train. So what do you require? You know, what kind of body position? Do you want the animal to sit? Do you want it to stand? Do you want it to lay down? Or is it just sort of hang out? That's why I have unspecified because you may not need any really specific criteria. Maybe they just need to sort of stay in the specific area. And like Al said, you know, theirs was, you know, a chin rest um, on, the, on the edge of the pool. That's a really kind of different um, uh, position, but it's it, but it works well for the species that they're working with, right? And what what part, what part, body part do you want to contact the station? A lot of times we're asking animals to stand. Maybe we want them to sit. Maybe we need their belly. Again, the chin, you know, it might be the right position for the animal you're working with. And then a really important one is what's the duration required? Because training for duration, we need to actually implement some specific things to get that duration. Um, and do you have a specific station identified or can it be, um, or is it a location, um, or can it be any available, um, station, so to speak? So like sometimes you'll walk into a space, a habitat, and there might be a rock or a perch or a stump. Um, and it could be just anything that's convenient that the animal might quote, put that, that, you know, body part on, maybe they'll sit on this or they'll stand on that or they'll lay on that, or maybe there's a specific platform. Or if you're working with multiple animals, maybe it's like whatever one is available, as long as an animal's not on it, if you station on that, you'll get, you know, reinforced for that. So you kind of have to have an idea in your mind, what is stationing going to look, look like. Um, and, uh, again, Will animals have their own individual ones identified? Do they need to be next to a certain individual? Sometimes we have that criteria. Um, and again, can they just take any available station that's open? So it's good to have a plan. What is it going to look like for your situation? And then what about getting stationing started? Oh, I'm blocking our little guy's face here. I'm going to move myself up here. Um, so again, our goal is to create an environment to generate the desired response so that you can reinforce it. So you may want to pick a station that's easy based on the ethology and phylogeny of the species. So, you know, this is a coati here. So getting on a stump is pretty easy for that animal. Um, but if it's something really super slippery and, uh, you know, that's not going to work well for this little guy here, uh, uh, maybe um, a branch that's just the right um, texture and width for certain parrots. We think about things like that. Like I don't really like slick PVC pipe um, for a parrot. That's not going to be very easy for them. You want to make it easy for the animal to engage with the station. So to me, I'm going to show you something with a tortoise in a little bit and show and tell you about some things that we did to make it easier for that tortoise to actually do the right thing with the station. And then how do we prompt that engagement? So you saw like with the lemurs, we lured them. That was, you know, I don't have a problem with that. You might target the animal over there, or for some of us, we have animals that orient towards us. So you might have to stand a certain way to get the animal to move towards your, your station. Um, and then once they're there, we want to reinforce for getting in that position. So that also means where you deliver the reinforcer matters. So you might need to reinforce right over that station or, um, or in a position so that the animal stays where you want them to be. So this is where that, if you're using food, that feeding for position notion really can make a difference. Um, and Annetta says also like cats, they like to jump on things. So they will do that all by themselves. Yeah, so again, if you make it easy, 
they might they might give you the behavior um, right away without you having to do a lot. So if you just set up your environment with the right kind of um, uh, station, they might do exactly what you want. Um, and then and, and it says click for action, feed for position. Yeah, so we're really thinking about, about reinforcing the animal where you want them to be in this particular thing when we think about stationing behaviors. Uh, so for that, um, let me uh, show you a video that I just took the other day of, with my dog. <laughs> so I, I saw this mat um, at the store that I thought was pretty cool. And, uh, and so I thought I'd just have some fun with him, um, having him put his front paws on it. And you'll see that mostly what I do is I just position myself and he gives me the action that I want and that's what I reinforce. And um, he has some history of me reinforcing him for doing things with his paws. And so you'll see he really offers kind of putting his paws in a certain place. And, and I'm very careful about where I reinforce his head so that he puts his paws on that mat. And initially, um, I'm giving him a lot of food the first time he puts his paws on, on the mat, even though that's not perfect placement, but I wanna build up the reinforcement history for your paws are on the mat, that's what I want. So I give him everything I've got um, for that, just to say, yep, that's exactly what I wanted. I want your paws on that mat. And then I, I, had, to, I had to go get more food. <laughs> And he's like, well, wait a minute. Isn't this what I'm supposed to do? This is where I got all the food. So he stays there even when I go in the kitchen to get more food for quite a while until he gives up. And so now he didn't really do what I wanted. So um, so I'm going to reposition myself or wait there. And uh, he did what I wanted there. So I gave him what I had. And there he did what I wanted again. So I gave him what I what I had. But now I'm, I'm going to want him to figure out to um, offer this behavior. So I'm probably going to do some reps here, I think. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move him off of that probably next, if I recall correctly. So that's probably going to be just following me. So how do I get the action? I just position myself so that he might follow me and give me the behavior I want so <laughs> so that was him doing that kind of slapping with his paws trying to figure out what I want and so a little refinement he he slapped him more centered on the on the mat which is what I wanted And so now just reinforcing for a little duration. But he's not on the mat, so he's thinking about what do I want? <laughs> Slapping his paws on the ground. That's not what I want, so I'm going to see if I can give him a little bit of a restart here. there it is that's what I want that that just placing them right on the map so so there you go all right uh, let me go okay so just like with our stationing um, or our targeting if we want to address fear responses if there's no fear response yet then we would just use that stimulus fading procedure, which you may recall from the targeting where maybe we're feeding, 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 and then slowly introducing our stimulus or slowly bringing our animal towards the stimulus. If there was a fear response, then we might use the negative reinforcement approach where we bring, uh, bring the animal closer and then away, closer and then away. Um, uh, and uh, I did want to um, talk about what if the person was the aversive stimulus. And I've got this interesting video with an eagle. Let's see if I can show you that one. Um, 
And so this eagle um, has learned to go to this map for food. And, um, and obviously one thing that's a little bit of a problem is that the food rolls away, and, but she brings it back to the mat, which is really interesting. Uh, but she also is not super confident with people being in the same space with her. And so um, one of the things that this um, person does work on is um, moving away from her when she's on the station. And trying to trying to work on um, seeing if she can decrease distance between her and the eagle but by but by approaching and retreating kind of thing So they're giving her distance. So, so she came on the mat, she gave her the food, but she also moved away from her, if that makes sense. So trying to, trying to use that combination. And so she has done this for a while. And so by doing that, she's been able to decrease the distance um, in general, and which has allowed her to be as close as she is with this bird who used to want to be like completely at the opposite end of the enclosure from her. So she's made a lot of progress with her. And she's just, she's one of these, you know, birds that came from the wild with injuries and can't be released back into the wild. So, and I think it's pretty cool that she stays there to eat the food, whereas she could easily just take that and go fly someplace else with it. And it is a pretty big piece of food. Um, so normally something like that, she might, a bird of prey might take someplace else if they were uncomfortable. So kind of cool. All right. So let me see what else I wanted to talk about here. Oh, okay. So um, I had a couple more things I wanted to show about or talk about when it comes to um, getting our desired responses with the station. So with this uh, guanaco, um, the guanaco had learned how to stand on the mat Oh, yeah. in that a specific location nice. um, over Beautiful. in that stall to the right there. And I like that but you were able to be in front of him He too. wanted to yeah, fine it, tune it, it and so have it have the animal like stand on the mat in the yard, yeah. but couldn't yeah. quite yeah. get it if he just brought the mat out into the yard. So one of the things um, yeah. he did, and I don't know if, if you can hear it, um, if I we're talking about it in the audio, I'll turn the audio down. So one of the things we talked about was we took the two logs and we put it on the one side there. And then just kind of changing the position of where he stood with the food, um, the animal uh, um, was a he was able to get the animal to put the four feet on the mat and um, and start reinforcing that. And very quickly he figured it out. So sometimes just setting up your environment a little bit and thinking about where you're standing and and you're able to get the action that you want so that you can reinforce it. So that was a little fine tuning there that made a difference. And then I also wanted to share with you the tortoise. So um, what we did with the tortoise is we used this uh, plastic square. And as you can see there, we um, 
covered the edges with dirt because the tortoises had an had a kind of a inclination to want to bite the edges but by covering up the edges then he was more inclined to just orient his nose towards the color which we see a lot of tortoises you know are attracted to the the colors of, that look like food um, let me turn down the audio and um and so we built up the reinforcement history of orienting his nose towards that and so then he kind of, you know, got the idea, ah, this is my station. And here you can see he walked over it and then uh, he couldn't find it. And then he was like, oh yeah, I know what I'm supposed to do. Look at that. Oh my gosh. You are so smart. <laughs> so we really loved that tortoise um, stationing behavior because they had all the tortoises had learned how to target, but they were kind of, um, you know, to a ball on a stick kind of thing. But they were kind of stalking the keeper because they were like, that's how I get get good stuff as I just follow you around but we wanted to teach them to wait and so to do that we wanted to train that stationing behavior and so by teaching something flat on the ground that you orient your nose to and just kind of keep repeating orienting your nose to something flat on the ground they learned this stationing behavior and so again we had to build up the reinforcement history and then teach him to just kind of hang out there and so um, that was him figuring it out and I and I especially loved when he walked over it and he was like, I don't know where it is. And then he moved around and then put his head down. You know, that was him figuring it out, which was really, really cool. All right, so let's uh, talk about building duration and how you get there. I'm, I'm gonna show you a civet. This was from some work I did in Indonesia um, a number of years ago. And you're gonna see that in the, in the beginning, the civet has no duration whatsoever. So how do we get that started? It's similar to what you saw with the tortoise uh, and, uh, um, and I do have more information on building duration in animaltrainingfundamentals.com, and I'll show you that at the end there. But in the beginning, it starts with just, we really need to reinforce frequently. So the animal, um, again, learns where, where, where does all the reinforcement happen? And, um, and you'll see by the end, he's like, oh, okay, well, I, just, I just should hang out here. So as you'll see in our before, he's like, nope, why should I be here? In fact, I'll just go home. And again, we don't want to use giant pieces of food that, you know, you just take to go. So we use small pieces coming fast. And notice where he's feeding. And yes, these are the the things that, you know, poop out the coffee beans, if you're wondering. But now look at him. Hmm, looking a little different. He's not having to feed so frequently. And I think it was a good decision by the trainer to bring him back home then.
Okay, so that building duration, we reinforce frequently at first. We insert short pauses in between reinforcers after we've done that initial reinforcing, you know, a lot at first, which is what you just saw there. And then we gradually increase the time in between, in between reinforcers, and then we work up to unpredictable intervals. And I think we've seen a few video, videos throughout all of this where you saw some of that happening. Um, and again, I have a resource in um, the program that walks you through the whole process in a bit more detail with some more videos. All right, let's talk about managing groups of animals. So it can be helpful to have um, several people to get started if you've got quite a few animals to manage. If you do have some animals that tend to gravitate towards getting all the resources and drive the others away, you um, really want to focus on that animal first. Get that one solid or fluent on the behavior first, especially if you are only or it's only one or two of you working with the animals, and then start stationing the other animals. Um, because basically they'll learn that that one is going to stay on his station. He's not going to drive us away. It'll kind of help everybody understand um, what's going to happen there. And um, you might have to reinforce those, quote, dominant animals more frequently for, quote, allowing the others to participate. And, um, and here you can see those, those conures um, on the next level. She started a... Uh, um, giving uh, names to everybody's uh, station and adding more conures to the mix there. All right, so uh, so let's look a little bit at some um, groups of animals. Here are some macaques learning to, these are Sulawasi macaques learning their own stations. You'll see there is a male who is more likely to dominate the situation and take everybody's food. Um, and then uh, you'll see that, you know, Individuals have to be reinforced pretty frequently and pretty fast in order to stay at their stations. And Netta says we also station our crocodiles when feeding to avoid um, them injuring each other. Yeah, I almost put a alligator one in here, um, but it wasn't as interesting to watch um, the video. It didn't have a whole lot going on, but we'll look at the macaques here. <laughs> That's for you, so you have two hands. Uh, yeah. And then you can, you can take a few. And then you can uh, feed can sort of both of them at the same time so that they don't grab at each other. And they learn that they don't need to mess with each other. Um, I don't know who you are. No. So, is that another one? one? So yeah, so the blue one is in there. The one it's that's in there. Eating, eating. Who's also yeah. eating that so one? Okay. Either the four that Let's we'll see if I can get her. In the... I can't really go that far away. Now you're really going to be having to run, huh? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. You did it. You did so it. These you are the four that I did have. Okay. Yeah, you're Great. fantastic. Lovely. Okay. Good job. Like those two that were sitting up there on the top there, they were there before, weren't they? Yeah, so this place stays the whole time. So yeah. They know not to push. They right. Know, they know what I rank. Right. Um, and even like if you offer them food besides or they won't take food off you because oh because they know he might know do he might. something okay these are my last three peanuts oh, okay. so. one left yeah okay juice, so. right. okay 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 whoops uh -huh. So um, some good comments here. Target objects, station objects. Do you find the words and actions are interchangeable by the trainers you work with? And also in the donkey photo, the mat is a stationing location and also a target to stand. Yeah, I, I tend to agree because I think, I think um, when I, even when I was writing this, I was like, well, what's the difference, right? And um, so I think it's hard to... Um, I think the this and and I was asking myself too what is the difference and I think where where the distinction maybe is <laughs> is that um, targeting may be not necessarily for duration I think we tend to ask for duration on stationing usually and that I think with stationing we not always but we tend to have animals either contact contact a sort of a limited array of body parts if that makes sense like it could be standing sitting belly or like you said with the chin whereas targeting might include a lot more body parts it seems to me those were some of the distinctions but i do think you're right that um there's overlap there right so that technically stationing also is sort of like a subset of targeting in some ways um 
so I do think there's overlap. I think I think there there are some interchangeability within that, if that makes sense. So I I think that that is where it gets it can be a little bit confusing. So I tried to uh, with my definitions, I tried to parse out what those those may be. But that's a really great comment. Uh, and Helene says, at a previous facility, we had the primary station and an extra one on the side. When working two birds together, the dominant animal took the primary spot and the other would default to the extra. Yeah, I like that. So you can address sort of these um, situations where you have an animal that's more likely to, to uh, want to access all the resources. <laughs> And, uh, and Pam says, very cool, thank you. Uh, sometimes the dominant penguin would be too slow and we would see them push their more submissive partner off the prime spot. Oh, <laughs> yeah, it, it is really interesting managing um, these situations where we've got one animal that's going to be more likely to try and access all the resources and, um, and how to address that. I, I think in most of the situations where I've been... Um, I do find if we can identify who that individual might be and if we can find a location that is maybe specific to that individual, hopefully, and like you said, you've got a way to manage it when, when uh, it isn't always specific to the individual, um, and really, really say, okay, that, that person, we're going to give extra focus to that individual. And I, like I said, I, the way I tend to think about it is... I am going to reinforce that one for allowing others to participate. That's sort of the way that I think about it. So it might be that that one gets extra and the other one may not get as much. It, so it may not be a fair sort of, you know, reinforcement scheme, but I'm teaching that one, you know, let the other ones play and then the other ones sort of relax more because they know the other one's not going to leave the station and do anything aggressive towards the subordinate ones. Um, so, so sometimes it does mean that the one that is more pushy is getting more reinforcement or you're getting reinforced more frequently just so that it doesn't leave the station and do something unkind to the others. Um, I will show you this group of, uh, spider monkeys here for our last video. And, um, and, Definitely, there are some in that group that are more likely to, you know, push the other ones off. And, and we kind of made his station um, in sort of in the prime spot, so to speak, like you're saying, the prime spot so that that he would get more. <laughs> um, and so all of their stations were kind of very much selected based on what they knew about the individual monkeys. And the stations were very helpful in... Um, training them to allow the shift doors to be closed and we also put the one who had more problems with the door handle being managed close to the door handle so that we could reinforce that one um, uh, you know anytime hands were making movements towards door handles and being removed and all that kind of stuff so again high, um, lots of reinforcement happening around that kind of stuff so here are the spiders So it was a short, short clip. Uh, and Helene says, yeah, in our case, it was, it was quite funny. The submissive would just circle back, take another spot and go to the extra spot instead, and then happily stay on that one. Well, that's good. I'm glad they worked it out. <laughs> All right, so I don't want to keep you too late here. So to uh, on the last, uh, I, you know, before the recap slide, I have common problems getting action started, um, fear responses, getting precision placement, building duration, managing groups of animals, which I think we, we covered a lot of this stuff here. Uh, and let me read Al's comment. Um, group training separation, stationing, and name discrimination. Um, one animal cues, uh, uh, one animal's, Cue to leave a station is a cue for other animals to station for duration. Yeah, <laughs> I like it. You guys, you guys have got some experience with station training, especially with groups. It's it's really fascinating stuff, isn't it? Um, I mean, again, I kind of went back to we think of you know like targeting last time and stationing this time as these basic behaviors, but they turned out to, they turn out to be kind of complex, don't they? They're not as easy, especially when we're talking about groups of animals as perhaps um, 
they appear on the surface. And you guys are definitely pointing that out also well. <laughs> so thank you for sharing your experiences. I appreciate it. All right, um, I, we're already going over, so I think I'm gonna bring it to the recap here. Um, stationing is what most trainers consider a foundation behavior, and it's a behavior that is often trained prior to training other behaviors. Key components might include deciding what the position is, where the animal will station, and what duration is required. Frequent reinforcement is desired um, for the desired position helps animals understand where to station in the initial stage, stages, and the schedule can be thinned as the animal learns to wait. Uh, maybe not so much for our dominant animals though, right? <laughs> they need to get it more frequently. Stationing groups of animals can be extremely useful, especially when un one animal tends to monopolize resources. Once trained, a single trainer can often manage numerous animals. Uh, once a stationing behavior is established, it can serve many purposes that are supportive to a force-free approach to animal training. This includes managing day-to-day -day care, training for medical care, and addressing undesired responses. Uh, and Annette says, I love foundation, foundation behavior so much to learn and know. And Al says, here, here, Annette. I agree, Annetta, I should say, I agree. How long have I known Annetta and I just said her name wrong? Oh my Lord, must be tired, still, still recovering from the jet lag. So um, we do have a few resources in animaltrainingfundamentals.com to kind of take this discussion further if you're working on stationing behavior. We do have something on training uh, um, uh, name tags. So if you wanna train individual targets for each animal, so they have their own individual target that could be used at a station, there's that. Um, we also have a You Be the Behavior Consultant on consideration when training multiple animals. And then in our How to Train a New Behavior course, there is a whole section on how to get duration. So you may find that interesting. And then of course, we did talk a little bit about what to do if something, uh, if an animal shows a fear response to something, and that is um, addressed in our um, When the Right Thing is Negative, Optimizing Welfare with Negative reinforcement. And speaking of that, if you haven't seen the replay of the IAZA Welfare Plenary, please watch it. I think you will love it. Um, we do talk about negative reinforcement in there, and um, my presentation on animal training that transforms and measures emotional welfare is in there. And there are a couple places where you can find it. Um, they did post, well, there's more than a couple places. They posted it on Facebook. Yaza posted it on Facebook. They also po posted it on YouTube. And I have um, shared the YouTube link in um, animaltrainingfundamentals.com. So you can, so if you're a member of Animal Training Fundamentals, you can also find this in, um, in animaltrainingfundamentals.com. So please um, check it out. And also, if you're a member, um, before I left, I shared these new badges. I had a request from one of my members. I had been thinking about it for a while. Uh, and so I finally put those together. So just something that you can share on your website or social media if you're a member that, you know, demonstrates your do, you do professional development and here is the citation for this week's um, uh, live stream <laughs> and if you're a member join us tomorrow we'll talk about all the cool things that we um, experienced at IAZA and at the other conferences and um, and all the fun things we learned so please join us at 11 tomorrow um, a.m. central time and if you're not a member please join us. It's fun. There's so many things to learn and so many cool courses in there. And, um, and uh, we'd love to have you there. All right. And all these great comments from people here. So thank you for a great Monday from Annetta. See you tomorrow. And thank you, Barbara and all. And from Carrie, so glad I could join today. Thank you as always. And cool from Al. So there you go. We went a little bit over, but you know, these foundation things, there's just so much to talk about. <laughs> You think they're going to be simple and easy, but but again, they're they're deep, aren't they? They're a lot deeper than we think. All right, guys. Well, with that, I won't keep you any longer because this is this went a bit over, but there was just so many videos to share and so many things to talk about. You guys had so much good um, feedback and input to to contribute. Oh, and great as always from Gail. Thank you. All right. Well, good deal, you guys. I will look forward to seeing some of you tomorrow. Um, 
hopefully more of you come on and join us we'd love to have you join us in our conversations they're casual they're fun you get to share what you're doing with your training and um you know so so it's a great opportunity to network and chat with the with your fellow trainers and share what you're doing with animal training all right guys i look forward to talking with you tomorrow and see you again next time take care bye everybody <laughs>